Welcome to this quick overview of Nabari. Nabari is a quick to set up, easy to maintain Jupyter Hub based AI platform, and it's designed in a way where teams can work and collaborate effectively. Today, I'm just going to walk through some of the major features. Uh, my name is Darhas Bathina. I'm the CTO of Quansight. Nabari was originally born out of the idea that it, we need to be able to quickly and efficiently set up a platform for organizations to do data science, AI, ML, and large scale compute. When we started in this process, we realized that deploying infrastructure in the cloud was very difficult. And this is an attempt to make it easier and more accessible to organizations. Nabari was developed by people who needed to use it. And so we feel we have a much better take uh, at fixing the pain points that uh, data scientists, engineers, and analysts often face in cloud platforms. Uh, so right now I'm going to get started by logging in. Uh, we use an open source software called Keycloak, which allows you to connect to different auth providers and connect to OAuth or Active Directory or SAML and things like that. Once you log into Nabari, you're presented with a landing page, which shows a lot of the core services that are available. And uh, later we'll talk about the app library, but uh, right now we are going to look at one of the things most people want to do, which is launch a server uh, and then either use something like JupyterLab or VS Code to do their work. So right now I'm going to go and launch JupyterLab. As you see, we have different options available. We have a small instances and then larger high memory instances. And then we have a couple of GPU instances. And so I'm going to pick this T4 GPU because we'll do a few demos on GPU later. And I'm going to click start. And this is going out to the cloud and firing up a server on Kubernetes uh, with a T4 GPU. And it's going to uh, launch you into uh, the standard Jupyter Lab notebook that a lot of folks are familiar with. Initially, I'm going to download some examples so that we can actually have some notebooks to play around with. So I'm going to take this demo example, I'm going to download it, and this will take a couple of seconds. I'm going to open this folder and just kind of start going through some of the examples. So this is Jupyter Lab. Everyone's familiar with it. I'm just going to run some code to do a time series plot, nothing fancy. Uh, if you notice, uh, this is uh, using a default environment, which has some packages already installed. But when I go to the next notebook, let's say I want to try a new software. I want to try Polars, uh, which is a really cool data frame library that's been really popular recently. And I am going to take this code and try and run it. And we get an error because we haven't installed this. And this becomes one of the core issues in cloud platforms is how do you manage the software that's available. And what we have done, instead of the normal approach, which is go create a Docker image and work out how to get that Docker image deployed in your platform, we've developed a software environment management system. And here I have a personal namespace where, you know, I have some existing environments, like I have a machine learning environment that has, uh, you know, scikit-learn and pandas, but I'm going to create a new environment and I'm going to call it try polars. And here I'm going to say environment to test out polars. And I'm going to add some packages. I'm going to add polars. And let's let's add a plotting library as well. So I'm going to add HV plot so I can do some plotting. And uh, I'm also going to choose which channel this library comes from. And I'm going to hit create. And this will take a few seconds and it will start downloading these packages and creating an environment for this. And while this is going on, uh, I want to point out a few other things. One is an extra package has been added on the back end. An IPy kernel is a package that Jupyter needs to actually function. And so we know that and we've put some rules in the back end to kind of control what's installed. And so our environment management sit, uh, system lets a administrator uh, add some controls to how packages are created. Secondly, let's look on this left column. Uh, you see, we had this personal namespace, my namespace, Deepathena, um, and I can I had the ability to create environments. We also have these shared namespaces or shared groups. And here I have an AI production group, and there's a group here for creating 
RAG applications, and this is a control group. Uh, it has certain libraries listed in it, but I cannot create or edit these libraries because I don't have access. But in this AI research group, I do have access and I can create new environments. So this is a mechanism which allows both researchers to create the things they need, but also to have controlled environments as needed. And every environment is version controlled. Let me go to one which actually has some versions. So if we look at this, this environment has several versions and an active version. And since I am an administrator of this group, I can choose which version is the active version or roll back to an old version. Let's move to the next section, which is app sharing. To motivate this, when we went, I'm going to go back to the main page. And in this main page, if you look down here, there's an app library that shows me different apps that were built by my colleagues and shared with me. And so this is an app that was built by one of my colleagues and it's a climate viewer. And since I'm authorized, I can now use this app that was created and shared by my colleague to, you know, this one's a weather station app and it lets you look at some weather station data versus climatology. So let's create one of ourselves. So we are going to go back here. This is a simple notebook where we're going to preview and try out a, a data set called Iris, which is about flower petal size and that does a simple classification uh, and clusters. And this is a small plot, which looks nice. I mean, uh, we're just previewing in a notebook and we're making a small dashboard, which uh, doesn't look very nice in a notebook. But so let's instead, let's preview what this would look like as a deployed app. So I'm going to click the preview button. In a few moments, you should see a preview of the little uh, dashboard we just created. And this lets us have this little interactive dashboard that lets us change parameters. And you can see the plot reacting as I change the different aspects of the data. OK, so we're, we're pretty happy with the way this works. OK, so I'm going to copy the path for this file. I'm going to move over to this uh, deploy app button. And here, I'm going to give it a name. My petal plot. I'm going to select the framework. This was using the panel framework for doing the plotting. I have to choose the software environment this runs in, and this will run in a software environment called demo dashboard. And I'm going to paste the file path here. Um, if I want the app to be turned on all the time, I can keep it alive or it'll shut down automatically uh, after a few, you know, 15 minutes or so. Then I'm going to choose who I'm going to share it with. I'm going to share this application with the AI research group. Um, and uh, I'm going, I'm not going to keep the public access uh, because I, I want people to have to log in to see it. Let's choose an image for the app. And I'm going to click next, choose what kind of server it needs. This is a really simple plot. So I'm just going to use a micro server and hit deploy. And in a couple of seconds, this app is going to be deployed on the platform and available to my colleagues at a URL that I can share with them. Oh, and they will also see it in their homepage. So here's the plot in full screen, and it looks a lot nicer now that it's deployed. If we go to the front page, we will see this application is now here running on a micro instance. Okay, let's go back and check on the polars plot we were trying to do earlier and see if this uh, environment is available now. So let me look here. Yep, the environment is available. So now I'm using this new environment I created and let's see if this runs. Yes, and it did this little example and showed me the data from the example. So again, environment management becomes central to a platform. And in Nabari, we have a fairly comprehensive system that underlies all the different applications that are used inside uh, the platform. Now, uh, we also, since this is JupyterLab, we have access to other IDs. Uh, so I can uh, open a terminal. And if I want to use the terminal, I can you know, see what files I have and do the usual stuff in the terminal. Let me download some code first so I can show you how to use VS Code. So I'm going to go to the Git plugin in Jupyter. And I'm going to clone a repository. And I'm going to clone an AI tool that Quantsight has built called Ragna. So I'm going to just put that in here and I'm going to clone it. And in a couple of seconds, I have this nice folder with my software. And I'm going to now open VS Code. 
and this will give me access to a full code editor with a debugger and source control and extensions and everything else that you need in a full development environment. We're a bit tool agnostic. If you want to use Jupyter, use Jupyter. If you want to use a full ID, let's use a full ID. And uh, we, we, give, we deploy these tools together in an integrated fashion. Moving on, I want to start talking about really large data sets and how to use accelerators on uh, the cloud platform. One of the big advantages of using cloud platform is you have access to different types of hardware. And here I'm going to show an example of how if I have terabytes of data or something, I can very easily set up a cluster. Uh, I'm going to choose again an environment for this to run in, a software environment. I'm going to choose uh, small workers here, just as this is an example. And I am going to ask for a cluster of machines. And this will give me back a connector. And here I'm going to say I want at least five machines and I want it to uh, adapt to 10. And so as we do the compute, it's going to ask for more machines as we have more things to compute. And so let me open some diagnostic windows so that we can see what's going to happen. Let me turn on the cluster map and also the progress bar. So that's, there you, there's the cluster map and there's the progress bar. And now let's run a compute. This is using a airline on-time performance data set from the uh, Bureau of Transportation. And if we look at this, this uh, I'm going to calculate how many flights we have per day in the last 20 years. And I'm going to plot the total number of flights every day for the last 20 years. And if you see this, this will start pulling in machines. Uh, right now you see this purple dot is a scheduler. And in a few seconds, you should see different machines popping up as, as they start up in the cloud. So now we have two machines and it's going to start doing the computation and keep adding machines as it needs more compute. And then when it finishes running, it's going to shut the machines down. So this is a very efficient way of doing really big data without having server costs continuously. And so uh, that we have the plot available now. And if we look at this, this is the last 20 years of flight data. And you can actually see when COVID happened and all the flights disappeared. And if you look at the whole plot, we're still not really back up to pre-COVID flights. And so this is sort of the power of being able to do interactive visualization on massive data sets. Now, the other way of accelerating things is using GPUs. And as you remember earlier, we picked up a server that's a GPU server. So I'm going to just turn on some plots so we can kind of see what's happening with the GPU. So right now we have a GPU and it's using zero memory and it's not being utilized, which makes sense because we're not actually doing anything yet. And I have a little bit of code here that just takes PyTorch, takes the ResNet 50 model and trains to epochs. And just to kind of show you that we now in this platform have access to GPUs and we can also look at how well our model is doing and what resources it needs. So in a second, you should see the GPU starting to be used. And if you look like look at it, this model is using seven GB of memory. And so in this particular case, using an A100 might not be the best option. And so the Ability to access different GPU types very easily just by starting up a server and shutting it down is a key part of why a platform like this can be very effective. In a couple of seconds, it'll finish running the second epoch and you should see the GPU utilization go back down to zero, but it's still gonna be holding the data in memory until, until we kill this um, notebook. Yep, and then it goes down. And if I restart this kernel, you should see the GPU memory also disappear. There we go. Another feature of Nabari is uh, here I have a notebook. It, it downloads a image of a cat and it classifies that image using TensorFlow to predict what kind of cat it is. And here's a small example. And uh, this predicts that this image is a Siamese cat with about a 13% accuracy. So this is interesting. Uh, let's say I want to download a 
image of a cat on a schedule every day. Don't know why, but let's do it anyway. So I have this uh, job creation thing and uh, with it, I can create a schedule. I can say every weekday or every hour or every month. I'm just gonna run it now to show you what happens. Uh, again, we have to choose the environment this is going to run in. Uh, this is why the software environments become a very critical underlay of the entire platform. And so when I hit create, this is actually creating a job and I'm gonna go over to another service. On the back end, this is using a system called Argo Workflows. In Argo Workflows, if we look at the workflows, you should see a new job has started up. And right now it's spinning up a server to run the job. And in a few seconds it will run. And then when it completes the job, it will update back in our notebook. This is another job I ran earlier today and it's completed. I'm gonna download the output files for that. And now I'm gonna see what it looked like. I'm gonna choose the HTML version of the output files. And it this ran earlier and it downloaded this cat and said it's Persian. So this is an example of how you can very easily write a notebook or script to do something and with one click schedule it to run uh, daily or monthly uh, or similar. With that, I hope you really enjoyed this quick overview of Nabari and some of the major features and things you can do with the platform. Uh, you can visit the website, uh, nabari.dev, and I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you.